You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Ace Adkins back on the show with me today. Uh, he has a phenomenal new book, and when we're recording this, uh, it's actually release day for the book. So when you're hearing this, the book is available everywhere uh, that you buy books. The book is called The Revelators, and believe it or not, it's book number 10 in the Quinn Colson uh, novel series. Uh, welcome back to the show, Ace. Absolutely. Man, 10 books in the Quinn Colson series. When did that happen? <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> very odd. 10 years can go by very, very quickly. It seems like I was just doing my first signing for the Ranger. Uh, but what it, I'm very grateful to have readers that keep on wanting these books. And, um, you know, every time you start a series or you think about it, is this going to work? Are people going to relate to this character? How long am I going to be doing this? What, you know, planning out things in the head. So it's, it's a nice thing. It's a great thing to be thinking about, um, 10 books. That's a, that's a, maybe I'll have a drink tonight. Yeah, I think you should. I think you should. Um, Ace, the last time we talked, we, we talked about some of your early love of Ian Fleming and uh, some of those early book series. Do you remember the first book or maybe it's a series or an author that you read that just, you you know, made you feel like you had been completely transported to somewhere else that you got to go on adventure with someone else. Do you remember the first book that gave you that kind of feeling? Well, I have to say it goes back to Ian Fleming. Uh, you know, I, I got into reading those books, but I was a fan of the movies and uh, I wanted to uh, learn more about that character. And I was a reader uh, as a kid, but I wasn't like a voracious reader. I wasn't always, you know, reading a book. I could you know, read a book for class or whatever. Um, but I picked up Goldfinger and then I thought, well, let's start in the beginning. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to read them all. And so I got a copy of Casino Royale and I was mm-hmm. just absolutely transported uh, to that world. Um, absolutely loved it. I loved the detail that Fleming put into I call it almost, they called it the Fleming effect, but it's almost like a 3D feeling that you're immersed in that world. And I think the beginning of the book was, you know, Bond could smell the, the sweat and the smoke at the, of the casino at 3 a.m. And I thought, oh, God, this is great. And I was probably about 15 years old and I was just absolutely hooked. And I went through all the novels. And, um, you know, in fact, I just got a copy. of I hadn't read Fleming in years. And I'm going to go back and reread uh, You Only Live Twice. And, uh, but just, just that, that made an impression on me, not only as a reader, but also, um, that maybe one day I wanted to be a writer. And I think that's, that's what a, what a big effect of that. We, we talked last time about the, uh, the, the first couple of books that you wrote it as you were learning the craft and, uh, you know, and, and maybe we'll see some of those one day, maybe they're destined to stay in a desk drawer or, you know, on a hard drive or, you know, whatever it is that, that we, that we do with books these days. Um, but do you look back on that time ACE and, you, you know, think back on a, on a young ACE Adkins who had never published a book before. And, you know, if you could talk to him now, what would you tell him? Uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> uh, find, find a, find an easier profession, kid. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, uh, for me, uh, you're, you're talking about those manuscripts. I did, you know, I wrote, wrote the wrote books when, you know, going back to, I was 19 years old, uh, 18, 19, I was started writing stories and that kind of thing. And they were, they were not very good. Um, but you know, anything you do, whether you're a painter or a mechanic or, or any job, you know, your first jobs aren't going to be your best. None of those manuscripts, I've got probably two or three unpublished manuscripts should ever see the light of day. Uh, because they were practice efforts, you know, they were practice, they were about uh, getting better. 
Uh, I don't know anybody who can really sit down and just write a book and, and be able to do it effectively. It took me a long time of, you know, not only, you know, having some good instructors in college, but also having some wonderful editors when I was a journalist and writing books and making mistakes and going back and fixing them. And sometimes with a book, I, I hear about people, you know, working on the same manuscript for years and years and years. Sometimes you just have to put it aside and move on to the next one. Uh, but yeah, any advice to a, a younger, a younger ASA Atkins, uh, you know, is, is just, you know, keep, keep working. And I think that's what anybody who wants to be a writer is just continue to work and continue to get better. Well, Ace, not only do you uh, write the Quinn Colson series, but you also uh, ha- have picked up the writing of, of the Spencer series for, for, uh, you know, that, that Robert B. Parker so famously um, pioneered. Uh, have you watched the, the new Spencer movie on Netflix by any chance? <laughs> uh yes i have yeah, what what did you think of it um well uh, as someone was, who gets to live inside spencer's are head, you I, uh hank are you a spencer fan i i'm a spencer fan yes okay all right a, well a spencer uh, book fan spencer book fan so i'll turn <laughs> the i'll be a good politician what did you think <laughs> yeah yeah, it was it was a it was an OK action movie. I, I don't know that it was a Spencer movie. No, and I think that's what mainly that I've heard from universally from fans is they've been patiently waiting for a Spencer movie for years and years. And uh, when it came up, it just wasn't I don't I, for whatever reason, they decided not to to make a Spencer. Movie. And I, I wish they had. <laughs> I think that, you know, Spencer, yeah. you know, Parker created a damn wonderful film. I mean, he yeah. did. I mean, Park Parker just, you know, damn, that what a great character. And I'm so, I really am honored to keep that that character going. Um, and I hope someday there'll be a, you know, a good adaptation. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, your new book, um, and and Quinn Colson, uh, these books really uh, give us a great insight and, and a window into Southern life. Uh, it may be the only window that that some readers ever really get to have. Um, but you know, Spencer is, is a different, uh, it's a different palette that you get to paint with. Um, how do you feel about switching between, uh, Spencer and, you know, his, uh, you know, that, that's a very specific setting and place and, and characters. And then your other books that you write, um, how do you, how do you feel about the difference in those two? Well, I used to, it used to be very difficult to switch off. Um, I know when I first wrote the first Spencer novel, uh, Lullaby, uh, it was like kind of like getting, being an actor, getting into character. And I really had to just immerse myself. I spent a great deal of time in Boston, you know, just walking through the neighborhoods where scenes would happen. And, you know, I, I really took it very seriously and really tried to get everything on. Um, and as things have gone on, if I've been doing Spencer and Quinn about the same amount of time, it's easier to transition off. I probably could write a Quinn scene today and then go back and write a Spencer scene. I used to couldn't do that. I used to do one or the other. Um, but uh, the voices are different. You know, it's not just the character. I mean, obviously, you know, Boston private eye, inner city, and you've got, you know, rural crime and, 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 and deep south stuff with Quinn. It's not just that. It's just the whole writing style is different. Um, I have gotten better because I've been doing this for almost 10 years that I can switch off. But um, initially, for those first few books, it would take me several weeks before I would get the voice right. It would be, I'd be writing Spencer, and it would sound like, you know, the South. You know, I'd have I'd have some Southernisms that were to be in the book, and it just the, the flow was off. And then I'd go and I'd write a scene with Quinn Colson, and it would read like Spencer. And so I have to be very careful of building the walls between the series because it's not like you know when Parker did multiple series, they all sound the same. You know, whether you're reading a Jesse Stone or you're reading a you know, Spencer book they all have the same voice but when yeah. i write these they're they're completely different that's that's amazing um speaking of quinn colson um you have uh this is the 10th novel in that series uh, amazing accomplishment uh, congratulations on that uh, um where did quinn colson first come to you uh from did do you remember uh the day he was born or kind of how he came into your imagination yeah, I do. And and this was something that was um, really um, discussed with me and, and really facilitated by my editor, my editor at that time, Neil Nyron. And Neil is a really a legend in the business. He's retired now. Uh, but Neil, God, he 
was one of the first editors for Carl Heiss and, and Tom Clancy. And I think he worked with Clive Cussler and John Sanford. I mean, just, oh, you know, C.J. Box. All, I mean, he's just, a, just done all these great series. And I had been, I came to him with an idea to write um, a book that was about uh, a mob war in 1950s Tampa and Havana. And uh, we did that book. We did another, we did several true crime books together. And he said, I really would like you to think about writing a series. And I had wrote a, written a series when I was in my 20s, very early on, that was set in New Orleans. It was very Spencer-like. And I was very hesitant to, to start a new series, but he really wanted me to do this. Um, and so I spent time, I, I really the, the forefront of all this was the South. I knew it was going to set in the Deep South. I knew it was going to be set in a rural community. I knew that I wanted a character who is a former military character, but not one of those dudes with, you know, special forces, <laughs> you know, that he, right. you, know, you know, I didn't, I don't write those books. You know, I don't, I don't do that. I just wanted kind of an everyday guy, kind of a, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a Will Kane character. And so all this kind of came in. And so it was a mixture of all the things that I just thought about, which is my advice I give to writers is write the stuff you love. And so I thought about stuff that I really love, which is, you know, I, I love William Faulkner. I love, you know, writing about the Deep South. I love Southern Lit. I love old drive-in movies, in the 70s. I love Burt Reynolds and, you know, Smoking the Bandit and White Lightning and all that. And I like, I love Walking Tall and Billy Jack. And I think all that just kind of came into. Ace, we, we talked about the, the difference between, um, you know, the Quinn Colson series and writing Spencer. What is it that makes a story quintessentially a Southern story? What, what is it that's, you know, we talked last time about this kind of gumbo that, that makes up Southern people and Southern culture. Um, but you know, when you're writing that and putting it on the page, what is it to you that makes a quintessential Southern story? Well, you know, aside from setting, um, I think that what I try to do is I try to bring in topics that are actually happening. And they actually are based on real events, based on real events. And I think that there's certain things that are happening in the South, although, you know, I, I have a this racist malicious group, militia group that has been popping up in the last few books. And I like to say they're, you know, they're completely fictional or they're just relegated to the Deep South. But of course, we're seeing these you know, in Virginia, and, and they're not necessarily a Southern problem. They're, they're, they're cropping up all over the place. Right. Uh, but, you know, what makes the Southern, outside the, the you know, the voice, um, the setting, um, you know, I try to get my people to be, uh, you know, people are, um, <laughs> you know, I always tell people Southern people want to talk about, they never want to talk about unpleasant subjects. They never want to get, and Boston people, <laughs> Boston people only want to get to the point. You know, they only want to tell you exactly what's on your mind. Uh, you know, a Boston person will say, you know, call somebody a, an a-hole or whatever, and it's a term of endearment. You know, you say F you or call somebody an a-hole down south and somebody's drawing guns. So right. you know, it's, it's a different way of life, a different kind of culture. <laughs> I just have to get into that. Want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level? Give pro writing aid a try. Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error-free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of Pro Writing Aid Premium. Pro Writing Aid. Check it out today. Uh, 
Well, speaking of that, Ace, um, you know, we're we're currently in 2020 and this uh, has been a crazy year that no one could have predicted, um, I think. But, um, you know, you you talked about uh, the South and its its particular challenges. Um, But, you know, we are seeing that a lot of the challenges that have been historically true for the South are, are really either they've gone nationwide or they've always been nationwide and the, the South has just gotten all of the attention. Um, but, you know, we are seeing uh, things all over the country with, with regard to uh, race relations and, you know, ugliness popping up all over the place. Um, do you feel like that, that these are um, essentially Southern problems that have moved? Is this, you know, uh, the human condition? Uh, why do you think the South gets all of the attention when we, in fact, see it popping up all over the place. Well, you know, Faulkner very famously said, you know, to understand the world, you must first understand a place like Right. So, you know, even though I'm writing about issues that are Southern and people that we have, you know, I never intended to write a regional book. I intended to write a book that was very specific in its feel of the region, but didn't necessarily just, just region. This was something more widespread, but, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, issues of race, corruption, hypocrisy, um, you know, we have that, we don't have that in short supply, but it certainly is a national pro- problem now. It's a national issue. It's something that I think that this current, you know, administration, this current age has opened up Pandora's box and allowed people to come out and um, is really this poison is is spreading everywhere and it's not localized um i think it's it's still interesting for me to write about the deep south because these issues are here and they are now but uh absolutely it's now become well i i think uh, you know here in mississippi um you know we are kind of in the midst of uh, this debate over our flag, what's well, it's not even, it's not a debate anymore. Um, Governor Reeves uh, has uh, signed the order, and the the old flag is down, and now we're we're waiting on um, you know committees to come up with new designs and all that 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 hopefully we'll vote on uh, this fall maybe. But um, it is is that kind of indicative of of the struggle? Uh, maybe struggle is not the right word. Um, the the this conflict of ideas where certain people, you know, think that, that, uh, you know, it, it's a heritage issue and this is, you know, we're erasing the past and then other people, you know, say we should look forward because our, our future is brighter than our past ever could be. Um, how do you, how do you feel about this struggle, this, this conflict of, you know, always being kind of tied to the past, but wanting to look forward? Well, it's a hard thing to, you know, it is hard to move ahead when you keep on looking over your shoulder, you know. Right. Um, I, that's what these books have been about, all 10 of the books, if I had to just put them in a, you know, very condensed version. It's about the Old South. And I don't know how much you've gotten into the Revelators, but there's a this oh, group yeah. that just idolizes and worships as a reverence for the, the Old South and for the Confederacy. The memorabilia from time it's all about turning back the clock it's about getting back to and of course as we know of anybody with any reasonable intelligence or read any history book we know that this grand and glorious time to return to certainly was a grand, right. and, glorious, a grand and glorious time uh for people of color uh you know and i think that the whole idea that we're going to turn back and it's back like it was 50 years ago or it was like mayberry and it's just not it's not an accurate idea so that's you asked me earlier about the draw of writing about the South is just, it's that um, it's, this is a very haunted land with a lot of secrets and not secrets, but, but just a very dark history. And it's something we have to confront all the time, but we're also having to confront, you know, a history that didn't really exist. You know, we're having to, you know, really confront a mythology, uh, which is very different from a history. And it's people don't realize, um, you know, everything is not homogenous in the South. You know, I, I tell one of my favorite stories I like to tell when I'm on book tour is I say, you know, my family helped settle uh, Mississippi and they were in Lowndes County during the Civil War. And, and somebody asked me one time, you know, what do you feel about your family? Well, I'm very proud of it. And they said, well, how can you do that if you don't, 
you know, if you if you're anti-racism on that. And I said, well, you didn't ask the question, which is what side did my family fight for? <laughs> They're perplexed that, that you had Mississippians that actually went and joined up with a Union regiment. And that's what my great great grandfather did. He joined up with a Union regiment and ended up spending most of the uh, the war in a in a Confederate uh, POW camp. So it's not always that there's, you know, anyone who thinks that this was all gone with the wind, um, you know, this is just not accurate. You know? and, and certainly the, the Confederate flag was not the Atkins family flag. And uh, the losing side, that's not really, you know, my family would die. But it's right. complex, it's complicated. And complications and complexities, of course, make for, uh, you know, sometimes hard living, but it makes for interesting. It does make for interesting fiction, and the as as the revelators uh, proves out, uh, when you were writing this book, and you know we understand how the public publishing industry works, you probably ha- were working on the revelators a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, probably it's been off your desk for probably a year, uh, while you go through edits and and different things like that. Um, but when you were writing this story, and and there's a lot going on in this book. Let me just say that. Um, that's one thing that I love about your books is there's always a lot going on. It's not it's not a simple you know A to Z narrative. There's there's all sorts of uh, pig trails and and things as we would say in the South. But um, the when you were first thinking about the Revelators, um, did you have any idea? that 2020 would be the way it is when this book came out and we would be, you know, uh, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball and, and you could, you couldn't see that today, but this book is especially prescient right now. Well, I think with the issues of dealing with it, it, it was written relatively, you know, it was written last year. So not that long ago, okay. um, but I would have never seen, you know, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, there's nothing in the revelators about the pandemic, but dealing specifically about addressing um, history, you know, racial injustice, uh, that's something that I've been writing about, you know, since the, the very first Quinn Colson book. I mean, the very first Quinn Colson book was about him coming home and finding this racist, ragtag, nutcase militia group had taken over his hometown, and it was about dismantling it was something that I wrote 10 years ago and it was, that was kind of a stylized thing. I, in fact, while I was writing, it, I go, I don't know, this is a little, this is probably a little over the top South. This is pretty, pretty Gothic. I don't, I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> now, you know, a friend of mine, uh, great writer, Jack Pendarvis, he pointed out, he said, you know, Quinn was battling those guys who were hiding in the woods playing war games. And now those guys are marching on the town square and he's right. And, uh, they're not just marching in the town square in, in Tibaha County, they're marching on the town square here in Oxford, Mississippi. And I could look out my window in my office and I could see guys walking around in, in military gear, holding AK 47s, walking around the Confederate monument. And it's, it is jarring. It's something that, no, I didn't think I would ever see anything that, Oh, you know, obvious just looking out my window, but it is, and it's out there and we're seeing that. And we're just seeing such an ugliness, just an ugly, ugly, ugly part of the South and human nature rising all over the I think that's the importance of these books and what drives me to write these books is I think we've all, whether, you know, you're reading books in the, you know, um, sheriffs cleaning up the town or you're reading, going back to the Odyssey about, you know, Odysseus coming home. It's all the same. It's all the same kind of story. And I think we need kind of moral heroes maybe, uh, more than ever these days. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. 
Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribbleophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribbleophile today at Scribbleophile.community. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches, like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. Well, the, the crazy thing to me is is not that uh, this would happen in fictional Tibaha County or or even uh, on on the square in, in Oxford that you're talking about, but you know, in 2020 we're seeing scenes like that play out in Michigan and um, all over the place, and I, that's something I don't think any of us could have predicted that these these stories of uh, uh, of conflict in the South are, are really national stories now. They are. And, you know, and I take an exception, you know, it's like one of those things, it's like, you don't want people, you know, you can criticize your family, but you don't like other people to criticize your family. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'll talk to you about, you know, issues in the South and things that we're embarrassed about and things. But, you know, I, I get very Southern very quickly when I'm like in New York <laughs> city and somebody starts bashing the South as being this, you know, um, place wholly filled with idiots and people there. But, you know, I write about, what I tell people, I write about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's a lot of yeah. good in this. There's a lot of bad and there's a lot of ugly too. But I just, uh, you know, I, I try to be, um, try to be accurate, you know, and I try to, to address those problems. Um, but yeah, it is a, it is a startling thing that, you know, people want to say that it's a, you know, this is a Southern issue. They have to be kidding. I mean, this is, this is something you, you know, see some of the most racist people in the world, you know, I was up in upstate New York last year, and you see a lot of, you know, very racist flags flying. Well, and and what a lot of people don't understand is that a place like Mississippi, um, where the 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 race divide is is nearly half and half, you know, white versus black, um, and it it's just impossible to be completely racist living in a place like that you can't completely separate yourself um from from other people you know you're going to no, have I, interactions and you're going to have to get along at some point yeah i think that's a very interesting point it's something that is the you know the better part of the south that people that aren't here they don't see it i just saw this really terrible trailer for a kind of a low budget action film that was set in the South and every character was white. The whole town was white and it was supposed to be somewhere in the South. And I thought, where the hell is this place? <laughs> right. You you've know, never been to the South. No, you've never been to the South. And um, I had a conversation also with some filmmakers some years ago and they said, well, you know, um, on the front of, you know, Quinn Colson, we, you know, are, are writing about this. We really want to have an integrated community. And I said, well, this is, this isn't, an, you know, the South is the integrated community. And that's what I write about. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the wonderful things that you see, you know, you see that with, especially with like high school sports and prep sports and you see 
everybody working together. And if, you know, that's, that's the frustration for people is, you know, how much further we could get along and so much we could accomplish all together. You know, and I think that's what we're, that's, that's the new South. The new book, The Revelators, is the tenth book um, that that we've seen um, in in the Quinn Colson series. Did did that milestone um, was that something that that uh, was on your mind when writing this book, or you know, is it just the next book in the series? Do 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 milestones like that mean anything to you? Yeah, I mean, it did. I I was you know I'm proud of the fact that we've got ten books and people are continuing to want to buy these and uh, still interested in Quinn. I mean, that means a lot. But also the 10th book, I knew just in the overall big picture, the big story, which is the interconnectedness of all the of the, all the novels, I knew at one point that um, some of this stuff that I've been writing about really was going to have to come to a head. And that's what The Revelators is. The Revelators is, is hopefully a big payoff for fans that have been following the book. Um, you know, very specifically, the last four to five novels. This is really the, the end game for all of that. When we when we first started talking, um, I said there's a lot going on in this book, and that's one thing that I love about your books. Um, but do you have a mechanism for for tracking all of the storylines and all of the details <laughs> that have led to this point? Yeah. You you've got to have a, a database of some sort, or at least a really manic looking notebook. Uh, I've have a notebook. I you know I honestly I'll be I really. You know, when I first started this series, you know, you'd never know. I mean, The Ranger could have been a one-off book, and right. I kind of wrote it as a one-off book. And, you know, hopefully writing a series, and hopefully, you know, your publisher wants more, and, and hopefully these books sell, and that w- that's what facilitates more books. But you didn't know. And so for the first several books, no, I didn't really keep track of, you know, who's who. And, and these books, you know, for people who don't know them, they, you know, it's not just about Quinn Colson and fighting corruption, this kind of thing. It's really about this entire fictional community. And uh, all about, you know, this county, Tibaha County, and, you know, who's on the board of supervisors, and who's the family tree that goes back to their early, you know, 1900s, and who's connected to who. And uh, I wish I had done a better job. I'm, I'm finally on book 10, kind of playing catch up. I've got something called a Tibaha County Bible, family Bible, where I'm keeping track of who's related to who, and, you know, <laughs> who's done what, and that kind of thing. But uh, in the beginning, I did a terrible job. And I'd have to constantly go back to the earlier novels, you know, who's who. You, you talked about that this book would, would feel like a payoff for people that have been following these storylines, and, and we we finally start seeing some resolution to some things. Um, what what were some of the, the challenges, the, the challenges that you have created in your book series that you were facing at the beginning? Uh, of, kind of where do we find ourselves in the beginning of this book? Well, the beginning of the book, you know, again, I kind of go back to what I talk about with kind of classic storytelling and, you know, very you know, basic, you know, ideas. And, and in the last book, um, Quinn was attacked by this militia group and, you know, left for dead. And it's very much what I'd call a walking tall situation where, you know, you've got a guy trying to, you know, establish order in this community and take down the corruption and take down this outfit. And he's having to now come back. And that's that's where we begin the revelators. We begin with what happened. And Quinn is now, it's, it, it takes place a year after the Shameless, and he's recovering from these really horrific injuries. Having some problems, taking some painkillers, and just trying to get that back. You know, and trying to where he was. And that's where we are starting to see, to really get into the core of this web of corruption. Mississippi, all the way into, uh, into the, the capital of Jackson. I, I hate to say this, um, but one of my favorite characters of yours uh, is is Fanny, and um, I'm not proud of that. But uh, oh, I should she... be proud of it. You should be. <laughs> I think that's a great thing. What? Tell me about Fanny. If if people are not familiar with her, um, she she fills a really unique role uh, in these books. Um, where did she come from for you? Well, she came from a few places. I, you know, I, one of the things that really was, I think, on my mind, um, not necessarily, you know, I was conscious of it, but I, I'd really love the show Deadwood. Uh, David Milch created this incredible kind of ecosystem to tell these stories in, in Deadwood. Some of the stories were true, and some of the characters were true, and some of them weren't. But I love the character of Swearingen, who was always such a great foe for Bullock. And um, 
one of the things that Milch talked about was he was very influenced by this film that I'm very familiar with, Nicholas Ray film, uh, called Johnny Guitar with Joan Crawford. And Joan Crawford plays the baddie, which is very unusual for a 1950s Western to have the heavy be a woman. And there's so much that's taken from that characterization of Joan Crawford in that 1950s West, Western. And then also the true life character, Louise Hathcock, who is the real life uh, um, madam that was, that was working in uh, McNary County, um, Buford Pusser, um, was, was shot. And so those two characters kind of came, um, came into uh, Fanny's DNA. So we've got Fanny who kind of holds down the the uh, the local um, she's kind of the local foil um, for for this storyline. But in this book, we also see an interesting storyline that comes up with regard to Mexican immigrants and the um, the work that's going on in, in chicken houses. If, if people have never been in the South, we we grow a lot of chicken here um, and uh, there's. Uh, this is this is another part of the the racial mix and divide that that people are maybe not aware of. Um, not only the the black and white issues, but now we have um, brown issues as as we have more and more Mexican immigrants that are coming in to to fill some of these jobs. And we, you know we've gotten some interesting situations that have happened where we've had ice raids of various businesses and things like that through the years. Uh, and and you use some of that uh, for this other really unique storyline. Um, tell me a little bit about that and where the idea for this came from. Well, when I was writing this, um, which was, like I said, last year, this was about the time the, the ice raids happened across Mississippi that did make national news where you had hundreds of undocumented workers rounded up. And what I was really struck by that story um, is, you know, no matter where your beliefs are, as far as what your feeling is on immigration, to see these kids being left at home when their parents just not returning. And you had many of these kids, this was their first day of school. They were going to school the very first day they come home and their parents have been shipped off to this, this facility in Louisiana. And so I really wanted to write about that. Um, the other great injustice that everyone, you know, should be aware of is that the undocumented workers were all punished, but the owners of the business for hiring the undocumented workers at less than an, um, you know a fair wage uh, or minimum wage, uh, those people went unpunished. And so I thought, boy, in a crime book, these guys are some pretty 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 bad people. And so yeah. I wanted to write it from the standpoint of one of the kids who had been left behind. And and what a great piece of drama that that uh, that allows for in in this book um, wh um what did you use for for research for for that particular storyline um that that you you paint it so vividly and uh what what did you do to prepare to write that part of the book well there were there was a tremendous amount of stories that were coming out of these small communities that were affected by these raids and, um, you know, you, I, you know, you just watch the interviews of some, there was, there was one young woman in particular who was, I think only like 12 or 13 years old, where she was just pleading to find out what happened to her mother. How could she find out where her mother, and that really struck me as a character. Um, you know, of course I kept tabs on, you know, you know, uh, there, there's also a, a very large, uh, immigrant community here in Lafayette County. There's also, a, a very big one, um, where I do a lot of research down in Calhoun County that is involved in the, um, the sweet potato trade. Um, but, uh, as far as the chicken houses, uh, as far as any research, I kept it as just probably as far away from a chicken house as I could get. If anyone who lived in the South <laughs> and has ever had to drive by a chicken house, even a mile away, they know that I can't imagine the horrors of working in, um, um, in, inside one of those plants and what the conditions must be like. But yeah, I just tried to, you know, kind of keep a pulse on what's happening here in my own community and, and what's happening um, nearby. In in this book, we we find our hero Quinn Coulson. Um, he has has been um, utterly, you know, he, he's he's licking his wounds um, in in the beginning of this book. Um, tell me about uh, Quinn's uh, journey through the previous nine books, and and how do we, uh, you know, who is the Quinn that we see in the beginning of this book? Well. You know, I, I think 
I like to see, uh, you know, for the lack of a better term, you know, kind of a rocky story. Everyone likes a good story. Yeah. And I wanted to leave Quinn in the last book, in book nine, you know, really at the at the bottom. He had been fighting this corruption and he'd been fighting these these criminals for years and years and years. And they finally won. You know, I, I thought it was an interesting idea. <laughs> you know, I got some criticism for it from some readers, but I thought it was an interesting idea to finish up a crime book where the criminals win. And so uh, this begins with uh, him losing in the last book and having to find his way up. Uh, I think Quinn, you know, as far as how he's evolved, I think he's gotten a little bit more of a, a sense of humor as the book has developed kind of a wry sense. Um, I think that, uh, you know, really, again, I hope he represents feels good about being a flag waver, but somebody who's really kind of humble and and I've, I've met people like this, men and women who, you know, serve the country, and just humble, good people wanting to do the right thing. Um, and then going back to just the archetype of the, the great Western pioneer, or even the image of Eastern all those, those kind of characters really help form. Well, what's interesting when you write a, a, a long term character in a series um, like Quinn Colson. We know that, um, you know, when I pick up the Revelators, uh, uh, there's uh, – I, I understand that there's probably going to be a book 11 with Quinn Coulson. Um, so, you know, I'm not as worried, you know, is Ace going to kill off this character that I love in this book? Um, and so, you know, as a writer, that that has to bring certain challenges. You know, um, everybody knows this is an ongoing series. Um, but what can I do to this character that that makes you want to be invested in a way that that he could be? Um, did, you know, what can I do to this character that's worse than him being dead? You know, can I torture him to the point that you know that that there's worse things that could happen to someone than dying? And I think you've really pulled that off. Um, I think that's probably it, at the root, root of many. Uh you know, writers who write about heroes or crime books or, or sadists at heart. <laughs> so yeah. we like to put our characters through the ringer. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, when, when you're dealing with a, uh, you know, a character like Quinn, um, what are some of the things that, that, you know, are, are going to be his soft spots? Um, you know, things that you can do to him um, that, that, you know, he may or may not come back from, but that, you know, will kind of tug at readers you know, heartstrings. Are, are, are there kind of some things built into Quinn that you know you can go to? Well, I think for me, it's, it's funny how things, sometimes you write certain things, but then your books are kind of marketed in a different way. Um, you know, I, I see books, you know, frequently you'll see my books lumped in with, you know, something like, you know, if, if people that read Lee Child, you know, Jack Reacher books might like, you know, kind of a Quinn Colson book or whatever. And I really, I, I love those Jack Reacher books and, and I've known Lee for years and years and they're fantastic, but he's really kind of the, the opposite of Jack Reacher in the fact that, you know, Jack Reacher is a character that has no um, ties. No, like, he's got a thing holding him down. He yeah. travels from town to town. Everything is new. You know, Quinn Colson has nothing but um, <laughs> things tying him down you know right. he's got a community that his family's lived in for generations and generations he's got a you know he's got his mother he's got his sister who's deeply invested in the community he's married now he's got uh you know two kids uh he's got a wife who works at the local hospital so that's his soft point is his ties his love for not only his family but for his family is for his community and the whole reason he came home from the army was to come clean up his own backyard so when things happen in Tibbahaw county and in and happen close to home, his home is his soft spot, whether it's family or whether it's just being the, the, the sense of place where he's from. The new book, The Revelators, a Quinn Colson novel, book 10, is out available everywhere. Now there's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, Ace, what, do, what are you working on now? Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, this book is out. Uh, just hit the streets, uh, as it were. Uh, are you working on another Spencer book, or are you back in Tibbahaw County? I am working on a Spencer book. I've had to adjust my accent a little bit. I've been working on the Spencer <laughs> book for most of the shutdown. Um, so it's, this is uh, this book is not taking place during a pandemic, but it's certainly this is what I've been working on the whole time. But it'll be out in November, and this will be my ninth uh, Spencer book, and it's called Someone to Watch Over Me, and that'll be out in, like I said, around around. 
Amazing. Speaking of uh, the pandemic, has this affected you and in, in your creative process? Uh, you know, I know a lot of writers, we, we, we tend to be in a room by ourselves a lot anyway. Um, but, you know, some people are struggling with the mental aspects of this. Um, how has this affected you? You know, I can't say that it really, I'm very fortunate to make a living uh, with a typewriter or a laptop. And I'm at my most you know, prolific. I am a hermit anyway. And I don't, um, you know, I, I, I'm able to work from home. Um, I do have an office that, you know, occasionally I'll check in with, but I don't have to. Um, but compared to my friends that are here in Oxford that are in the, the restaurant industry or they're musicians or they're, they're having to go to, to, to work in these stores um, or working in hospitals, I mean, I, I am very fortunate that I can, you know, um, I, I live and work in, in, in my own head. And that's, a, that's, that's been a good thing. I've been very fortunate. And uh, we are appreciative for that. Um, Ace, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the incredible stuff that you do, um, where can they find you online? Uh, they can find me at aceatkins.com. They can find me on Facebook. They can find me uh, Twitter, um, Instagram, all those kind of places. I'm, I'm all over the place. Great. We'll put links to those to make it easy for people to find. Also to the new book, The Revelators. Uh, Ace, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking time to come back on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate it. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world settings safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 250,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too.